we're uh, going to continue on our lesson series that we have been looking at for the past several years. They were women too. And tonight we're on lesson 25 and we're going to be looking at Jezebel and her life. I thought this was um, quite interesting that she would come up at this time that we would be studying her. Um, when I started this lesson series, um, I just put a bunch of the ladies in order. And as you know, each year we start, it, start and go through. And of course, some of the years we haven't been able to complete the whole list because of snowstorms, but we didn't leave out a lesson. We just went to the next one. You know, we just kept going. And so I really had no idea what we would be doing tonight, two or three years ago. But here we're studying Jezebel and the spirit that represents, that she represents. And I just thought it was interesting because of the time that we are in our nation right now and everything we're facing, that this would happen to come up tonight. But anyway, so here we are. Lesson 25, Jezebel. And let's begin by a short introduction to this woman. Her character. Well, she was a religious woman. She spread idolatry throughout Israel. She was powerful. She was cunning. She was arrogant. She actively opposed God, even in the face of indisputable proofs of his sovereignty. She opposed him. Her triumph, well, she was able to enhance her own power at the expense of others. Her tragedy, well, her arrogance led to a very shameful death. And the key scriptures we're going to be using tonight come from 1 Kings and also 2 Kings. In 1 Kings, we're going to be looking at chapter 16, verses 29 through 33. And then also in 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, that whole chapter going to chapter 19, the first two verses there. And then 1 Kings 21, verses 1 through 25. And then the second Kings will be looking at chapter 9. So those will be our key scriptures tonight. For our readers, when you look at the list of scriptures that are on your study guide, you will notice a few that are in parentheses. You will not be reading the ones that are in parentheses. I just put them there as a scripture reference because I will be commenting on them and, uh, and talking about them, but we won't be actually reading those particular scripture references. So tonight, uh, we're going to start, um, as we have for our other lessons, by looking at the life and times of the character that we're studying. So we're going to be looking at Jezebel's life and times. And the subject I pulled out of this was Baal worship. So here we have her life and times and Baal worship. Jezebel was raised and trained in Baal worship. She spent the years of her reign not only worshiping Baal, but forcing Baal worship on her subjects. Statues of Baal showed him standing straight and tall, wearing a helmet topped with bull horns. And, a, and this was supposed to be a sign of power, of fertility. In one hand, he held a spear, and it was entwined with leaves, possibly symbolizing lightning and maybe even plant growth. His other hand held a club, which may have symbolized strength or perhaps even thunder. Baal worship involved the use of incense, it involved the use of sacrifice, and these were common forms of worship in that day. It also involved worshiping demons, using idols, using incense stands, and prayer beads in their rituals. It involved paying homage to serpents and to other creeping things. Its sacrifices at time involved innocent human beings. 
And we find that in Jeremiah 19, 5. So would our first reader please read Jeremiah 19, 5. They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Also, since the main function of the god Baal was to make the land and animals and people fertile, fertility rites formed the chief part of Baal worship. Male and female attendants performed sexual acts in order to induce Baal to lavish fertility on the land. The worship of Baal held a unique attractiveness to the Israelites. When they wandered from their faith in the one true God, they often wandered toward trust in the false god, Baal. The Israelites worshipped Baal during the time of Barak and Balaam, as well as during the time of the judges. And I have three scripture references here that will tell us this. So let's read the first one, Numbers twenty-two forty-one. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up into high places of Baal, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. Okay. And then in Judges 2, verse 13. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Asherah. And then Judges chapter 6, verses 28 through 32. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it, yet, it is yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore, on that day, he called him Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. Even after Elijah's triumph over Baal on Mount Carmel, and after the death of 450 priests of Baal on that same day, Baal worship continued off and on all during the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah. The worship of any false god is, of course, hateful to the one true God. We know that. To us, Baal worship seems like a disgusting and even foolish practice. We think of ourselves as far too sophisticated to understand its appeal. But aren't false gods just as prevalent today as in Jezebel's day? Consider, for example, the popularity of the New Age religion or the way we worship sport heroes, or the way we worship movie stars and millionaires. Ours, unfortunately, is a society that bows to the God of money. Our societies bow to the God of sex. Our society bows to the God of power. We would do well to remember that anything, no matter how good it may seem, Anything that surplants God's place in our lives can become an idol if we let it. And now with that little bit of background on Baal worship, let's continue on to her story. Let's look at Jezebel's story. What's in the name? Well, sometimes nothing. But in this case, in the case of Jezebel, the name is packed with evil connotation and has many times been used as a symbol of lewdness. Rare is the mother who would name her baby daughter Jezebel. And tonight's lesson focuses on the story of this woman 
who had such an unsavory reputation. She's first mentioned in the 16th chapter of First Kings. So let's go there and let's read First Kings 16, verses 29 through 31. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asia, king of Judah, began Ahab the son of Omri to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. In the ninth century before Christ, which was approximately 100 years after King David's death, and 60 years after Israel split into the two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, that which happened just right after Solomon's death, the northern kingdom of Israel came under the reign of Ahab. The scripture states that he took to wife Jezebel, who was the daughter of Ithbaal, king of the Zidonites. We read that in verse 31. The Zidians, or we better know them as the Phoenicians, were a remarkable race. They were a notable maritime people in the ancient world. They worshiped the pagan gods uh, and goddess, the fertility god and goddess, Baal and Ashtaroth. To them, Baal alone was the god. He was the god of nature and the god of war, as well as the god of procreation. These followers of Baal erected temples and altars on hilltops or high places near their villages where they offered sacrifices and performed their rites. Jehovah was regarded as only a local Hebrew deity, a god of the land. It was among this idolatrous people that Jezebel was raised. Her father, Ithbaal was the king priest of this nation of Baal worshipers, and it was from him that she inherited her fanatical religious enthusiasm. Baal had no more devoted and dedicated person of worshiper than Jezebel. None could match her zeal for the worship of the goddess Ashtaroth. Jezebel's worship of these evil deities provided the religious basis for all of her activities, for she subscribed wholeheartedly to the philosophy of pleasure and self-centeredness. As the king's daughter, Jezebel's every wish was her servant's command, and no ethical or moral implications were ever considered. It was this heathen woman whom Ahab chose to marry. How or where did the strong-minded, idolatrous Phoenician woman and the weak and spineless king of northern Israel meet? We're not told. Perhaps seeing her, Ahab had been fascinated by her beauty and by her forcefulness of character and fell in love with her. Perhaps Jezebel, who was ambitious and proud, eagerly seized the opportunity of sharing the throne with a king. Perhaps their marriage was the result of an alliance between Jezebel's father, Ethbaal, and Ahab's father, Omri. Even so, as a Jew, Ahab sinned against the Hebrew faith in taking an idolater as his wife. And this rash and sinful act resulted in evil consequences. Jezebel, as a woman of great conviction, a great conviction, as a woman of unwavering devotion, directed her ardent worship to Baal and Ashtaroth, not to the God of Israel. From the minute she set foot in the palace as King Ahab's bride, 
she began a 27 year wrestling match with two rulers, an earthly king and a heavenly king. A smaller kingdom than her father's and a childish monarch for a husband provided a very fertile playground for this willful woman. For the previous 60 years, idolatry had already made terrible inroads into the life and ways of the Hebrew people and had come to mean more to them than the breaking of the first two commandments of the law. This had brought spiritual and moral disintegration to northern Israel, and it quickly escalated under Jezebel's determined effort to destroy the worship of Jehovah. Not content with establishing the idol worship of her own country and her husband's court, she sought to convert Israel to Baal worship. Two heathen sanctuaries were built, one at Jezreel with its 400 priests and the other at Samaria with its 450 priests. Ahab was like a puppet in the hands of his overpowering wife. It may have been that Ahab was more luxury loving and sensual than he was cruel, but under the complete dominion of such a ruthless woman, he was forced to act against any decency or any principles that he may have had. Her husband's obvious weakness of character contributed to Jezebel's ruthlessness. Because he was pliant, because he was weak, Jezebel found it easy to achieve her sinister designs. It was Jezebel who became the feared commander in Israel and not the cowardly husband she could wrap around her thumb. In a most relentless fashion, she hunted down and killed all the prophets she could lay her hands on. You can read about this in 1 Kings 18.4. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water. I've taken a poem from the book, They Were Women Too, written by, by Joy Jacobs. And this poem has been written in the voice of Jezebel. They may be totally wiped out. I cannot tolerate. They must be totally wiped out. I cannot tolerate their kind. They seek to ruin my life here and they confuse the people's minds. Their God is sanctimonious. He won't allow them any fun, but they'll be gone when I am done. Despite Jezebel's best efforts, one prophet escaped her, and he was the most annoying prophet of all. His name was Elijah, which meant, my God is Yahweh. One day, he appeared suddenly before Ahab and predicted three years of drought. Of drought. You can read that in 1 Kings 17, 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And Elijah's prophecy came true. After three and a half years of drought and famine, Elijah once again appeared before the king, and he challenged him. He told him to assemble the prophets of Baal and Ashtaroth, and he wanted to compete in a very lopsided contest. There was going to be 850 to 1. Let's read about that in 1 Kings 18, 17 through 24. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. 
So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hold ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. The Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call you on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. The story of Elijah challenging the assembled prophets of Baal and Asheroth on Mount Carmel continues in verses 25 through 40. We won't be reading those tonight, but you can look them up later if you're interested. These verses tells us that two bulls were prepared for sacrifice, but the, sacrifice, the sacrificial fire was not lit under either one. From morning until noon, Baal's prophets danced and shouted, Oh, Baal, answer us. But the false god of the storm was silent. Relishing the spectacle, Elijah couldn't resist a few well-aimed taunts. He said, shout louder. Perhaps Baal is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's asleep and must be awakened. Elijah's sarcasm spurred the prophets of Baal to more frenzied efforts. But Baal, the false god of fire, couldn't even light a match that day. Then came Elijah's turn. To dramatize the difficulty of his task, he drenched the sacrifice with water, not once, but three times. And he prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Let's read 1 Kings 18, verses 38 through 40. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. However, the triumphant Elijah had yet to reckon with Jezebel. 1 Kings 19, 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Jezebel was enraged at the news that Elisha had slaughtered her 850 prophets. Again, reading a poem in the voice of Jezebel taken from Joy Jacobs' book, They Were Women Too. Ahab, you must be kidding me. You let him get away with that? Where is your backbone, silly king? Why didn't you kill that alley rat? You had him there within your power with all the people as support. Since you didn't kill him, now I must. Tomorrow is his day in court. Jezebel swore a terrible oath to destroy Elijah by this time tomorrow. 1 Kings 19 verses 2 and 3. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. And Elijah, although he had defied the king, and although he had stood alone against the multitude of priests and worshipers of Baal, 
He felt that the fury of a murderous woman was more than he could face. He fled for his life across the kingdom of Judah, leaving the haughty queen for the time being. She was in undisputed possession of the stage. Although Elijah had escaped from her grasp, Jezebel did not have any difficulty finding other targets for her wicked schemes. Life was cheap to such a female who had murder in her veins. Her father, Ethbael, had murdered his predecessor, Thales. Brought up in such a home of intrigue and in a home of massacre, what else could be expected but the same type of behavior from Jezebel? As a typical Oriental tyrant, Jezebel was prepared to murder in her stride toward the desired objective, as the incident of Naboth's vineyard reveals to us. Let's read this story in 1 Kings 21, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it, or, if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me, that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise, and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. It is obvious from Ahab's reaction when he didn't get his own way that he was no, in no wise a leader, spiritual or otherwise. His way of handling a problem was refusing to eat and lying in bed with his face to the wall, just like a pouting child. Jezebel discovered her, her husband Ahab in this childish rage. Again, reading a poem in the voice of Je Jezebel, taken from They Were Women Too, written by Joy Jacobs. What is her problem, Ahab, dear? Your appetite's usually prodigious. They say you will not eat or drink. Your fast is certainly not religious. You say you want a vineyard now, but Naboth won't give it to you? What is your problem, spineless king? Just let me tell you what to do. Jezebel's personality was very much like her father Ethbel's, aggressive, violent, willing to do anything to reach the desired goal. How she must have despised Ahab's weakness. Is this how you act as king over Israel? Jezebel challenged. Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard. Reading another poem from They Were Women Too, written by Joy Jacobs, again in the voice of Jezebel. I never would have thought it, but Ahab's encumbered by tradition. The do's and don'ts old Moses gave, they made the law and called religion. I'll teach those peasants who's in charge, and pious Naboth will be shamed. I'll write a letter to the mayor and tell him Naboth must be framed. The Jewish laws infuriated Jezebel, since in Phoenicia, nothing could countermand the king's wishes. She decided to make Naboth a public example of what would happen to anyone who defied the king or the queen. 
we see the same fury against God's laws and unbelievers today. The world is full of greed and hate. It is full of envy, murder, fighting, lying, bitterness, and gossip. All around us, we see backbiters, haters of God, insolent, proud, braggarts, always thinking of new ways of sinning and continually being disobedient to their parents, just as it's described in Romans 1, verses 29 through 30. How easy it is to slip into those patterns if we are not careful. Let's read 1 Kings 21, verses 8 through 10. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And set two men, sons of Beel, before him to bear witness against him saying, thou didst blasphemy God and the king and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Notice the fanatical zeal with which Jezebel set about accomplishing her self-assigned project. Jezebel wrote a letter in Ahab's name, and she sent it to the elders of the town. She instructed them in this letter to produce false witnesses to testify that Naboth had cursed both God and the king. Both of these offenses were punishable by death. The potential for wickedness within a human being is frightening. Each of us, no matter how good we think we are, have the Jezebel personality uh, possibility. Thank God for his redemptive power that will save us from ourselves. Let's go to 1 Kings 21. We'll read verse 11 and then skip down and read verses 14 through 16. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants of in the city, and as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Ahab felt better when he heard that Naboth had been stoned to death as a traitor. Now his table would be laid with delicious fruit straight from the vineyard. Let's now go to 1 Kings 21, verses 17 through 19. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. Although God had been patient with Ahab and with Ahab's family, the Lord could no longer tolerate Jezebel's love of sin. As Ahab was leisurely strolling through his new vineyard, who should show up but Elijah with a message from the Lord? Ahab said, so you found me, my enemy. Well, Elijah's confrontation with Ahab was direct. It was unafraid. I have found you, Elijah replied, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord is going to bring disaster on you. He will consume your descendants and cut off from your family every last male in Israel, slave or free. And concerning your wife, the Lord says dogs will devour Je Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. 
And you can read that in verse 23. Again, reading in Je Jezebel's voice, this poem taken from They Were Women Too by Joy Jacobs. The nerve of that impertinent man defined Jezebel the queen. He called me murderer and thief. Doesn't he know I reign supreme? He even prophesied my death. Oh, wouldn't he be overjoyed? He cursed our entire family, said all of us would be destroyed. Elijah's words came true. This prophecy was fulfilled shortly after his pronouncement, for war broke out between the Israelites and the Syrians, and Ahab, while riding in his chariot, received his death wound. The blood-soaked chariot was taken to the spring, which ran through Naboth's vineyard, and the dogs came and licked up the bloody water. Jezebel's oldest son, Ahazah, died from a fall out of a window, and her second son, Toram, was murdered. Reading another poem taken from that same book, They Were Women Too, written by Joy Jacobs. This is Jezebel speaking. Elijah's getting his revenge. His God has claimed my oldest son. Jehu has murdered yet another. And now he says I had better run. I'll never run. I am the queen. Jehu's just a rebellious slave. I won't quit fighting you, Jehu, till one of us is in the grave. Five years, 10 years, 15 years passed, and God set aside a decade and a half for one woman to repent. But she didn't have on the screen a quote that I've taken from LaJoyce Martin's book, Mother Eve's Garden Club, and this is what she said. Jezebel was unique. Not many people would ignore a beware of God sign, but Jezebel did. When God sent a direct delivery message by the prophet Elijah, she didn't even blink an eye. The note said if she didn't change her way, she'd end up as dog food. Unbelievably, the threat of becoming a Gainsburger didn't faze Jezebel. Her bumper sticker could have read, 1-800-WHO-CARES? God appointed Jehu to be king of Israel and ordered him to destroy the house of Ahab. Let's read 2 Kings 9 verses 4 through 7. So the young man, even the young man, the prophet, went to Ramaphagilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting, and he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of all us? And he said, To thee, O captain. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord even over Israel. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. One day Jehu came riding into Jezreel to carry out the last half of Elijah's prophecy. 2 Kings 9.30 and when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out of a window. I'm going to be reading another excerpt from LaJoyce Martin's book, Mother Eve's Garden Club. This is what she had to say. Jezebel heard through the grapevine that Jehu was in town. She looked out an upstairs window undaunted. She was used to wowing men. She loved it. So she put on a fresh coat of face paint, fixed a picture-perfect fi picture hairstyle, and chose her most alluring outfit. Had she had known anything about Jehovah, though, she would have understood that paint and powder couldn't camouflage her inner ugliness. She would have realized that he took inventory of souls, 
not cosmetic cases. Repentance would have made a difference. Sackcloth and ashes might have covered her sin, but a haughty spirit was bound to fail. 2 Kings 9, verses 31 through 33. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Have Zimri peace? Who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod under her foot. And he trod her underfoot. <laughs> Tough as nails, Jezebel stood proudly at the window of her palace. With painted eyes and a perfectly fixed hair, she looked every inch the queen. Never one to back away from a challenge, Jezebel seized the initiative, shouting at Jehu, have you come in peace, Zimri? That was the name of a traitor. You murderer of your master. But Jehu simply ignored her, challenging challenging those who stood near her, who was on my side, throw her down. Quickly, Jezebel's servant shoved her through the window, watching her body hurtle to the ground. The palace walls were splattered a bloody red as horses trampled her, and the palace dogs finished the job. 2 Kings 9, 34 through 35. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, Go, see now this cursed woman, and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. A powerful figure while she lived. Hardly anything of her remained just shortly after her death. Jezebel's body never found refuge in a grave. When they finally got around to collecting her remains, the dogs of the area had eaten all but the skull, the feet, and the palms of her hands. 2 Kings 9, verses 36 and 37. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, this is Jezebel. So died Jezebel, thy idolatra, the tyrant, the murderess. She had sown to the wind and reaped the whirlwind. Many of the godly in Israel must have felt that while Jezebel held evil sway over the land, the judgment of God seemed to move slowly. They came to realize, however, that the judgment of God moves exceedingly true and sure. They came to realize that God's judgment does come, not on our time, but on his time. Jezebel provides us with God's best object lesson of what a lady ought not to be. Paired with Israel's worst king, Jezebel was the nation's worst queen and one of the Bible's most infamous of women. I'm going to be reading an excerpt from Dr. Herbert uh, Lockyer's book, All the Women of the Bible. He said, while the Bible does not analyze or even portray her character, but simply sets forth the events in which she bore so prominent a part. Yet as we read between the lines, we cannot fail to see her as a woman of prodigious force of intellect and will. The sacred narrative does not record that she possessed any of the finer, nobler feminine qualities. She knew nothing of the re restraint of higher principles. Savage and relentless, this proud and strong-minded woman carried out her foul schemes. A gifted woman, she prostituted all her gifts for the furtherance of evil, and her misdirected talents became a curse. Persuasive, 
her influence was wrongly directed. Resolute above other women, she used her strength of character to destroy a king and her own offspring, as well as pollute the life of a nation. No matter from what angle we approach the life of Jezebel, she stands out as a beacon that the wages of sin is death. Evilness and godliness bring their own reward, and the wicked reap what they sow. How different Jezebel's story would have been had she harnessed her power, her drive, and her devotion in service of the one true God. A strong character, she could have been a female apostle like Paul, whose misguided zeal was redirected toward the kingdom of God. Instead, and like many biblical figures who are depicted with a mixture of good and bad traits, she stands out as someone purely evil, whose moral character is one-dimensional. Totally devoted to her gods, she reflected their image completely. Despite obvious miracles and repeated warnings, she was a woman who chose to harden her heart and suffer the consequences. In the dictionary, Jezebel's name appears as a synonym for a wicked, shameless woman. Not a very pleasant way to be remembered, is it? But it is good for us to remember her because each of us has a little of Jezebel's attitude, a little of her controlling spirit, a little of her pride. We all need to beware of Jezebel. And as we end her story, we come to her promise. Jezebel, Jezebel's end was exactly what Elijah had earlier prophesied for her. No doubt judgment for her wicked life was swift and sure. Sometimes it's hard to reconcile this aspect of our God with our image of him as loving and compassionate. Yet he is a God who hates evil and will surely punish it. If, however, we come to him for forgiveness and reconciliation, he is also a God who, shoves, who shows mercy and loves to do so. Jonah 2, 8. They that observe thine vanities forsake their own mercy. And Romans 5, 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 and 21. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as Though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And James 2, 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. I have chosen for our song tonight as we come near the end of this lesson, an old, old hymn, Is Thy Heart Right with God? And I'm asking Sister Renee if she would help lead us in this song. Have thy affections been nailed to the Washed in the crimson flood Cleansed and made holy, humbly and lowly Right in the sight of God. Hast thou dominion or self and or sin? Is thy heart right with God? Over all evil without and within. Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. 
Is there no more condemnation for sin? Is thy heart right with God? Does Jesus rule in the temple within? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. All are thy powers under Jesus' control. Is thy heart right with God? Does he each moment abide in thy soul? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Art now thou walking in heaven's pure light? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy soul wearing the garments of white? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Thank you, Renee. And now, as we come near the end of our lesson, we come to our life applications. We have discovered in the story of Jezebel's life several important lessons that if we are wise, we will apply them to our own lives. We have learned under the topic of dealing with life's problems, and this should be in the very back of your study guide, we are to ask the Lord to point out the wrong priorities in our life and to help us get them out of the way so that he is free to work. We are to face our problems constructively and not with violent anger and not with defeatism. We are to remind ourselves that every problem we face is teaching us growth of character if we allow the Lord to work through it. When we find ourselves tending to look down our nose at others who are going through problems, we are to remember those times in our life when we went through similar problems. And we are to heed the word of God as it clearly distinguishes right from wrong and also clearly warns of the results of disobedience. Under the topic preparation for future, since the days are coming when the fury of the world will be directed more, even more vehemently against the Lord's people, we are to prepare for that onslaught by firmly tucking away the word of God in our heart. Under pride and selfishness, we are to ask and allow the Lord to free us from pride, which will make us follow our own path instead of the Lord's and which will bring us to destruction as surely as it did Jezebel. We are to ask and allow the Lord to rescue us from our own selfish longings and to clothe us with his humility and righteousness. We are not to make the decision to serve the Lord. We are to make the decision to serve the Lord and not ourselves. We are not to fear the Lord for the wrong reasons, but for the right ones to stand in awe of him because of who he is. Under life perspectives, we are to be aware that sinful man has always changed the truth of God into a lie and has always taken the beautiful gifts that God has provided and made them dirty. Yet the Lord has been patient with us and for this we should be grateful. We are to remember that it is the Lord's goodness that leads us to repentance. And although it is easy to see how unwise the Israelites were in preferring heathen gods to the Lord, 
we are to remember that sometimes it is not as easy to see that we too put other gods before him. We are to be thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ saves to the uttermost. We are to be grateful for the Lord loving us during all the very unlovely times in our life. We are to be grateful for the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we are to never make light of the Lord's justice or his power. And under lifestyle, we are to live in a way that honors the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And now we come to her legacy in prayer. Throughout this next month, during your daily time of prayer and devotions, I encourage you to praise God that he does not allow evil to go unpunished and offer thanks for justice even when it seems to be delayed. I also encourage you to confess any tendency you may have to take God's mercy for granted and to ask God to give you a healthy fear of offending him. And we come at the end of our lesson to her legacy in scripture. At the end of your study guide under the title, Her Legacy in Scripture, you will find a series of 10 questions that are designed to provide you with an opportunity for further study and further insight into the life of Jezebel. I encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity by taking time to go over this material. And I'm just going to take a couple of minutes here at the very end just to read these questions quickly to you. They're at the very end of your study guide. And I just wanted to bring them to your attention because I think this is good review. Question one was, many Israelite kings married foreign princesses in order to strengthen Israel's alliances with other countries. But May Ahab's marriage to Jezebel gets special mention here. What does this tell you about Jezebel? Number two, Jezebel's reputation in scripture is one of sheer wickedness and selfishness. What sort of reputation do you have with your family, with your church family, with your co-workers, with your friends? What can you do to make your reputation one that honors God? Number three, what does Jezebel's action in this verse tell you about her devotion to Baal? And that's 1 Kings 18.4. What makes it obvious to people you meet that you serve the Lord? Compare, number five, compare Jezebel's and the Israelites' reactions to the Mount Carmel duel. What do you think made Jezebel so dedicated to Baal? Number six, how dedicated are you to the Lord? What might cause you to rethink that dedication? Number seven, what does this story tell you about Jezebel and Ahab? Who do you think was really ruling the nation? Compare 1 Kings 21, 1 through 7 with 1 Kings 21, 25. Number eight, what is significant about the fact that the Bible mentions that Jezebel painted her eyes and arranged her hair? What do you think Jezebel was getting ready for? Number nine, how do you get ready for a difficult situation, for conflict? And the last question, the story of Jezebel's demise is a disturbing one. She eventually got what we think she deserved, but consider, what do any of us truly deserve? And what, if we're followers of Christ, will we get instead? Some interesting questions that's worthy of your thought and consideration. And now we'll close this Bible study by what I always remind you, that the amount of spiritual growth you enjoy as a result of this study will be a direct result of the amount of time, prayer, and effort that you invest. And I want to thank all of you for your kind attention. The Lord bless you.